is. Come on, got a steam powered computer. There we go. OK, so that's us started recording. There were some issues last week with people unable to access the streams. Are they all sorted now? Yeah. Sometimes there is an issue in terms of um, logging in, but if you go via the web at least once, that should then let you get access to it. I still don't see me be able to access them, Tony. Uh, Tell a lie, that's them active now. They weren't working last <laughs> night, but they're working now. <laughs> no, I mean, sorry. That's Sod's Law for you. As soon as somebody else gets involved, something changes. I'm genuinely wondering if the simple act of attending the meeting has forced the um, Microsoft server to recognise that you're allowed to be here, which yeah, then maybe, yeah, sort of yeah. streams or something like that. I don't know. It's just a guess. All right, a couple of bits of housekeeping. First of all, thank you for doing your groups. Uh, there are still some people who haven't chosen a group, but that's fine. I'll uh, later on today, I will set you up randomly. I did send out an email. There's a couple of groups that um, I only have a couple of members in them. So you're meant to have four. Some of them have only got two. Um, I did send out an email, but I don't know. Moodle seems to be slow as, as well as everything else. Um, if you want to grab another couple of members, that's fine. Let me know. Otherwise, I'll just randomly uh, assign another couple to get you up to the four. Remember, there's an awful lot of work to get through for this. So if you have a, a smaller group, it's still the same amount of work, but there are fewer of you to, to do it. Uh, I was starting to talk about the case study today, so I'm assuming you've read it because you've all had plenty of chance to read it and we'll certainly be doing that in the tutorial later. Um, and one of the things, again, I've posted it in Moodle. Again, I don't think it's actually come through. One of the things we'll be doing in the tutorial next week is having your first formal interview with a staff member. So I've sent an email asking for proposals. So you'll get that. Stick it into the the discussion forum, and towards the start of next week, next week maybe Tuesday or something, I'll set up an online poll so that from all the nominations you can all vote to see who turns up to be interviewed next week. Because if you've read the case study, you'll have understood that it's not complete. There's other information that you're going to need. So you're going to have to start thinking about what the information is, who's the best place, who's best served to, to give you that information, what sort of information are you going to need? So you might want to have prepared questions specifically tailored to the particular things that you need. And today's tutorial will be partly dealing with that. So it's thinking about who's all involved, and what you need out of them. And if you haven't yet checked out uh, the section for today, you'll see that in there that I've pointed to a, a specific document and I've said that that's what we'll be doing in the tutorial. So you can have a look at that when we're in the tutorial. OK, so. Having said all that. What I want to do today is actually start talking about that kind of stuff, start thinking about how it is we go about deciding who's involved in a project. Uh, and the fancy name for that is stakeholder analysis. Who has a stake in what's going on? However, before we do that, I want to give you a quick presentation about how we approach these things. And it's talking about how we actually come to conclusions and how important it is to put aside our own preconceptions for that. 
So why don't we just start this slideshow here? For some reason, Windows has decided that screen two is screen three and screen three is screen two. So let me try that again. I don't know. Yep, yep. ladder of infinite. Okay. So we do like our fancy words in this module. So the idea behind the ladder of inference is trying to differentiate between um, active thinking and non-active thinking. And I don't mean that pejoratively. I used the example last week, if someone throws a ball to you, you don't think about catching the ball. You don't think about how fast the ball's going, how big it is, how far away from your hand it is. You just do it. And that's fine. We need that. When someone runs at you with a machete, you don't think, oh, let me just work out my options here. You just run. But when you're involved in a project like this, when you go in somewhere with a whole bunch of people that you don't know, with a business that you don't understand, it can be really helpful not to go in with any preconceived notions. It's important to think about our thinking. Because as I say, we think about things all the time. Oh, there's a big noise. Oh, it's a car horn. Oh, I'm on the middle of a road. Oh, I'd better get out of the way. All without really thinking about it. We always make those connections, we put them in. But quite often our preconceptions and our biases lead us to look at particular pieces of data at the exclusion of others. There's some things that we think, oh yeah, I want to understand that or I want to use that. And there's other things that we ignore. So we go in somewhere, we see data, we use some, we ignore some. The stuff that we use, we then interpret based on what we already know, where we've already been, different conclusions that we might already have had. And we do that because we don't think about what it is we're thinking. We just do it. And my bet noir, the word that I quite possibly hate most in the world is obvious. When people tell me things are obvious, I immediately question what it is they're saying. Because most things aren't actually that obvious. When you're doing this kind of work, saying something is obvious, doing it because it feels obvious is an incredibly poor approach to it. Because we don't question ourselves, we don't self reflect, we don't think, have I done that the right way? We instead bring our own biases, our own prejudices to what we are doing. We're working for someone else trying to get the best outcome for them. That's not fair on them. And that's what the ladder of inference is. We observe things. You then take some of the data from what you observe. So you're selective in what you use. And then that subset of data that you've selected, you put your own meaning onto based on what you already know, what you have how you've grown up, what experiences you've had. So you take some of the data, use your own prism on it, make assumptions on that distorted data, then draw conclusions 
about that subset of distorted data, which you then use to say, oh yeah, I was right in the first place. And that happens because you're using your own beliefs to only select certain bits of data and then say, well, that means I was right in the first place. And then you take actions based on that. If you don't believe this, if you think I'm talking nonsense, I encourage you to go in and spend 10 minutes on Twitter. Simply read any post on Twitter and read the replies. And you'll get a whole bunch of people telling them how stupid they are. And you'll get a whole bunch of people telling them how perfectly they've encapsulated the reality of the world. Both of those things can't be correct. But it happens because the people that are replying have observed the data, the post. They've taken out of it what they wanted. They've applied their own meanings, their own beliefs, their own assumptions, and they've drawn a conclusion based not on what was written, but largely on what they've thought from the beginning. Can I ask, Tony, would that kind of breed into your uh, professional issues of like your core beliefs and uh... I forgot the other one, selective beliefs. Absolutely. People use their core beliefs as a way of approaching a problem. And sometimes that's OK. But sometimes it gets in the way of actually solving the problem. So when we're doing the project in here, I want you to set aside your own beliefs, I want you to set aside your own assumptions, and I want you just to work on the data. I want you to take objective data and use that. And working in a group will help with that because we have different experiences, we have different beliefs. So if one person in the group takes a certain meaning from a piece of data, someone else in the group can challenge that. And I know we haven't completely done it this year, but that's part of the reason why I like random groups. If we self-select in groups, actually a lot of the time what we do is self-select people from the same cultural background, people with the same type of personal belief, people who make the same sort of assumptions that we do. That's why we end up being friends with them. When you have a random group, you get a broader set of experiences. And actually, the research shows that because people are drawn randomly, because they're not previously friends, they are more likely to challenge what's said within the group. for very clear reasons. When you're working with your friends, you don't want to upset them. When you're working with people you don't really know, you're more likely to say, well, hang on, are you sure? Did you get that right? And Adam's quite right, the fancy name for it is confirmation bias. And I think that was one of the things that I pointed out on that quiz that I got you to do, that you should all have finished yesterday, which you didn't all finish, and I'll be having words with the people who didn't do it. Adam? Can I raise an issue with that quiz? Uh -huh. um, there were several of the questions that it marked me as wrong for. However, the answer I had put was the same as the answer you'd put, Justin like a, a slightly different way. I think um, the one of a dark room, what do you like first? I put the match, it marked me wrong. And then said the answer was match. And I was like, mm, okay. Um, yeah, it's, yeah. It's, 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 a, it's a limitation of the quiz on Moodle. So it's a limitation of the software. I have to put down something that you have to match to and it, it literally matches exactly. Ah, OK. So you put the match and I put mm -hmm. match. So it goes, oh, no, that's the wrong answer. 
Right. But Fair enough. Again, you can use your own interpretation to decide whether you got it right or not. Yeah. Correct. As you know, it's not something that's marked. It wasn't a it wasn't something to see whether you knew the answer. It was something to point out these kinds of things. It was just to raise it in case you weren't aware that that was an issue no. or something. That's fine. No, if I do it on a more, um, if I do it on a, a formal assessment, I actually tr spend a lot of time trying to figure out different options. A match, the match, upper and lower case, matches, you know, all that kind of stuff. But for this, I didn't. <laughs> Great. So yes, I did know it was there, but so I'm not worried about it. Um, and again, there's a few people in the in the chat just backing you up there, Adam. So just what I'm saying, don't worry about it. You didn't get it wrong because it wasn't a wrong answer. It was to try and um, bring forward some of these concepts and to try and understand them. It's certainly not going to go towards your final mark or anything. Shame. I did quite well on it, other than that. <laughs> yeah. I did quite well. Mm. I, I do like the kind of like, you know, like the the kind of puzzle kind of quiz questions and stuff. It's just I tend to not be very good at them. Like I remember years ago, there was one I seen from like a Batman cartoon and it was like, it was something like, uh, like how many... I can't even remember. It's something to do with like 40 winks. The answer to the riddle was 40 winks. And it was like, how do you best sleep at night or something like that? And it's like, I do think about them, but it's just I never seem to find like the little answer that's obviously hidden in the question itself. Well, I mean, that quiz, I mean, you're quite right. They were kind of riddles in that sense. But some of them weren't. Some of them were about thinking and about applying logical thinking rather than just jumping to the conclusion. Yeah, because like you read the, the thing about you walk in with a match and there's a lamp and a paper and whatever the other thing was. So you focus on the what's in the room. You don't think about, oh, actually, no, I've walked in with a match. And there may be some fire-breathing dragons in the in the class that could light the paper with their breath, but no, there isn't. And it's exactly what I'm talking about. It's not so much that it's a riddle. It's about taking the data and not being selective about it, actually reading it all and coming to a conclusion using all of the data, not the bits that you have decided are important to begin with. It's the same reason that I put some things in that quiz that are remarkably counterintuitive. There was one of the questions where it worked out that smoking was good for you. Smoking, to be clear, is not good for you. You should not be doing it. But the way the question was posed, logically, that was the only outcome. Which brings me to another point. How you phrase your questions can quite often uh, frame how you get the answers. You can ask questions in different ways and get completely different answers. So I want you to think about that when we're doing it. So it's all part of this stuff. It's about not going in with preconceptions and about thinking about what's in front of you and what it actually tells you. Not simply working on your beliefs and your assumptions. So that gives us that uh, ladder. How we think decides how we move up that ladder. Our models of how things work. The conclusions that we draw, everything in our brain is screaming to say, I want this to tell me that I was right all along. Some of you have had me for computer programming. And one of the things I say in computer programming is when you're building a computer program, you are the worst person to test it. Why? Because you've built it. You've spent a lot of time building it. You're proud of it. So the last thing you want to do is make it go wrong. It's the same with this. 
You've built your belief system. You're happy with your belief system. It's how you got to where you were. And anything that challenges that can be incredibly disturbing. For some people, challenging their belief system can be so disturbing that they will go to their capital city and try to break in to the seat of government because some orange person with a bad comb over has told them to. Now that's clearly an extreme example, but it shows how powerful these sorts of things are. So we are good at working things out. We have to be. But quite often we don't have time. We don't have the need. It's not worth it. We, we've worked out some things so we don't have to go back and look at them again. But we do reach different conclusions sometimes about different things. So we have to be really careful and make sure that when we're approaching problems, we have thought them through and not just bring our own biases to them. And again, there's that word obvious. I cannot stress enough. If an outcome to you seems obvious, that is exactly the time that you should be questioning yourself. If it is so obvious that there can be no other road, then I think it's your beliefs that are bringing you to that conclusion rather than the facts. That's why we get to the point of people shouting at each other because they're not actually listening to what's going on. They've just decided that that is the answer. Everyone gets an opinion, but you don't get facts. And in this module, and I hope for your career, you'll look at facts. There's a whole set of um, stuff around this. And if you move on, when you move on to honours, uh, Don does a, a module on systems thinking soft systems methodology it's called and it gets this idea and takes it to the next level um, to how we actually connect within the organization and to everyone else you can only do that if you're open to seeing what's going on because if you can't see what's going on how can you end up changing it? And for your case study, if you don't see the facts that are in there, how can you actually change that business? Questions? Putting aside the issues with the Moodle quiz giving you the wrong result, did you find it interesting? Did it trigger any thoughts about how you may approach things in the future? Yeah, Stop talking yeah. to me. <laughs> Reread the question. Um, but it's just, as I said, it's just some of the ones that's like the answer is obviously written, uh, hidden in the question for you. Like the one, Emily's father has three daughters. One's April, one's May. What's the third one called? Emily's father. It's right there. Yeah. But yeah. stuff like that. But the number it's, of people that will immediately say June. Yeah. It's like that was my first thought. I was just like, June, and then I was like, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. And 
you just have to have a wee look at it. The one with the match and stuff, like that's just me watching Bear Grylls too much. Like you need to have a longer fire source, so you go to a newspaper, light that up, and use that to as a torch while you're in. So that's my influence of watching Mr. Grylls. I'll have to take your word on that. Okay, I've, I've hammered the point in long enough, I think. Um, try and put aside your preconceptions. Try and actually read what's in front of you and try and get the conclusions from that. And within your groups, challenge each other. Say, why? Ask, why? Understand why. Tony, can I ask, can I raise a small counter argument to like your uh, your random group suggestion? Mm -hmm. So I've worked in like the software company and stuff as well. And the big thing that I think separates it from a uni coursework to an actual job is who you're answering to. Like, for example, a lot of people in university and stuff are young. They might be taking either a particular module or a particular thing just to explore their ideas and options. So I think motivation is a big thing to take into it as well. Like if somebody's not motivated in a module or group or course, it's going to hamper the end all result for the rest of the group, I believe. Because um, in a workplace, if you're not pulling your weight, your boss is going to come down and be like, here, you need to pull it up or you're out of here kind of thing. Whereas in university, you've got the opportunity to go back and maybe either redo it or do a different module to make up for the credits. I wouldn't necessarily disagree, but I would make two points. One is everyone that's chosen this module did choose it. It's not a core module anywhere. Well, I so don't, there, I'm, I'm so just there should be a certain amount of self-motivation because it was a choice. And the second thing is being in a group can actually help give that motivation because otherwise you're relying on the likes of me trying to get everybody to um, be motivated. But if you're in a group with a bunch of people that you don't know and you're not pulling your weight, you're soon going to find out about the motivation of the other people. And that can actually help pull you along too. I see Moodle has just decided to send out the email. Sorry. Um, so, yeah, I take the point. I wouldn't necessarily disagree with it, but it can work the other way too. Uh, I agree that your points are very valid as well. The, I think for a lot of you guys, you would much rather never see a group again because it can be horrendous working in a group when you have people who aren't pulling the weight. But I did make the point last week, employers are really keen that you work in groups. They want people who can work, walk into a room and start working with people and have strategies to find out how to work with people. And it's far better that you develop those strategies here when uh, the worst possible outcome is you get a slightly lower grade than in real life, where you suddenly find that you can't work with people and that means you don't continue in the job. That's the idea anyway. Any other questions or comments just now? All right. So one thing I very much learned in T1 is that I ramble on too much and don't give enough breaks because we're sitting staring at the screen too much. So if only to give Gillian time to change from, I want to say chicken. It's a pigeon. Um, is it a pigeon? pigeon is that what it is? Oh, I need my glasses, I think. I can't honestly say I've ever seen a pigeon with blue eyebrows, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why um, a pigeon would want to be it. Is that Downing? Is that Westminster? 
there in the yeah. background. Hence the Minister for Agri- Agriculture crack. <laughs> it's outside Westminster. Keep up. Jeez. Okay, so we will take a break. Um, and I learned my lesson last week. I'll not even bother asking you. We'll take a 15 minute break and I'll see you back here. Oh, Adam's happy. Um, 15. I have to go and make a coffee. Yeah, I'm going to put the kettle on too. Okay, see you back in 15. Thanks, folks. Cheers.
So it turns out even 15 minutes isn't long enough to make a cup of tea. Who knew? OK, so before we move on to the next part of the lecture, uh, Declan's going to sing. I'm not sure which particular song it is, but. Cool, I'll Declan, link my Patreon in the comments so you can all support me in my singing career. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not going to sing. I only sing when I'm in a good mood, apparently, so you all missed it. Yeah, it's best we sing about the first minute you hear it. Come on. Not a chance. Get chance. Plus, but... are you suggesting that being in my lecture doesn't put you in a good mood? No, I'm saying that maybe I am in a good mood because I've been in your lecture, Tony. So you're ready to sing. Fantastic. Yes, and I'm, I'm ready to receive all those Patreon nominations, guys. Please get those subs and I'll link my Twitch and specs and equipment in the corner. <laughs> Right, Declan, the stage is yours. On you go. Oh, I seem to be having some functions, so uh, I, I'm... Bye. It, it's not going to work, I'm a... OK, those emails came out, I think, while we're on a break. So I'm just looking. There's still a couple of teams uh, that only have two people. And I haven't heard anything from you, so if you're on this call. Oh, no one person did get back to me, so thank you for that. Um, so the other team haven't mentioned what they want to do. So I've got... No, in fact... I've got ah. some reminders for Tony. <laughs> thank you, Google. How kind of you to let me know that. Right, OK. Uh, Mubin, you've got back to me, but actually you don't seem to be in a group just now. Unless I'm missing it somewhere. Tony, can I ask a quick question whilst you're doing that, just in regards to like the tutorials for next week and stuff? Yep. When we're requesting like staff members or, or people with a, a stake in the business, are we able to ask them to bring along like documentation that we can view, or is that not something that's sort of available? You can, and if the documentation is available, it will be provided, and if it's not, it won't. Cool. Perfect. Thank you. And that's a kind of general thing. So you can always ask for documentation, whether it would normally be the purview of that particular person. So when the uh, in that discussion forum, you can ask for documents as well. Um, so yeah, ask ask for them. <laughs> I was trying to figure out if there's something else I wanted to say or whether I was giving too much away. And I'm just, well, yeah, I'll just leave it there. <clears throat> You're welcome to give more away if you'd like. <laughs> don't think any of us are going to complain. I would encourage you to ask for any documents. And I'll leave it there. Hint taken. Although, I'm genuinely unclear as to how a Raspberry is going to type up a request for a document. It's uh, going to be tricky. Oh, use your nose. OK, fair enough. All right, so that's the, um, that's the groups that are already there. The so group, group D have got back to me. 
I haven't heard anything from Group I or Group H in terms of getting a, a full group. Come on. So Group I, that's the two names there. Group D I have heard from. Uh, and Group H I haven't heard from. So if I don't hear from you um, before one o'clock, so first thing I'm going to do in tutorials is set up the final groups. So if I don't hear from these groups before one o'clock, I'll just do it randomly, OK? So do you guys not get to see the names, Megan? You can, you just have to click the bit that says show group members. I was, just oh, I was just being nosy this morning. I think it's because I was on a phone though. Yeah, I did, I did um, encourage you last week to use a computer occasionally because it does look very different and there are things that you miss. I just wasn't sure if the showing group members was something that I got as a lecturer and you guys couldn't see as students or whether it was just you'd missed it. OK, OK, so that's the groups that we have so far, which a quick calculation suggests that there are about 14 people not yet in a group, so I'll just randomize those ones. OK, unless anyone has any questions, we are going to move on to the, the main part today. Let's see, is this going to come up on the right screen? Yes, it is. Good. So I want to talk a wee bit about stakeholder analysis. Stakeholder is a fancy name for anybody that has an interest <clears throat> in your project. And sometimes you have to actually work through that and try and figure out who it is. So like I said, that's what you're going to be doing in the tutorial today. It can be for any change. So the one that you're looking at in your case study is a change in a business. Owners are retiring, business isn't making that much money. What's the best way forward? So it's quite a big project. It's deliberately big to give you a lot of things that you can play around with. And when you're producing your final report, I'd like you to try and address as many areas as you can. But you'll, you'll do the same thing for smaller projects. It could be just a new policy that's going in. If you make a new policy, you figure out who it affects. There's a new policy now that um, students got an extra seven days without penalty because um, of the pandemic. So things are tough, get an extra seven days uh, in order to ensure that you can do what you need to do and not be penalised, which is fine. And don't take this next bit as a complaint, because actually I do support the policy. When that was brought in, it wasn't completely thought through. So any of you that have, uh, are in any of my other modules will know that I've been struggling to keep up with the assessments. Because I worked out that changing that process, changing that policy rather, meant that everyone had an extra week to hand in their work, which meant that lecturers couldn't mark anything until the normal hand in plus a week. It also means that it, we also made a change to bring the the terms really close together. So there was only a week between the end of one term and the start of another term rather than the normal three weeks. So what that meant was I simply couldn't carry out my marking duties in the time that I had. I had 200, over 200 students in T1 and I simply couldn't do it in that time because of that change to policy. And as I say, I'm, I, I actually, it was a good policy, but 
consideration hadn't been given out as to how that would work for everyone. So the thought was help out students. Fine. But there was no thought about what happens when assessments need to be marked. And after I've marked them, I hand them on to some admin people who will distribute them. And we've, you, you all know that they get moderated and they get externally moderated and all that kind of stuff. So I have to mark them. It has to go to the internal moderator. It has to go to the external moderator. It has to then go to a board. There are admin people involved in setting up all those things. There are external people that see them. So that small change means that there's a lot of ripple effects that happen and people are affected who weren't even consulted or even notified about the change until it happened. And not surprisingly, that then causes some friction. So one of the things you want to do is start to understand who is involved, either a core person or department or organisation, or even one just on the periphery that you just might want to keep involved. We'll see lots of terminology, so just like everything else, this kind of stuff uses terminology and stakeholders are often known as actors. You actually see that a lot these days in the news, you know, bad actors or good actors or whatever. But it's just a way of describing people who are involved and it could be just individuals, but it could be a group, a department, an organisation, a government, whatever it happens to be. Anyone who has an interest. So it could be internal, it could be external, so it could be your users. You might decide that um, running a front desk is very expensive because you have someone that has to be there all the time, which is true. So you're going to send them home at, say, nine o'clock in the evening, which is fine until somebody arrives at your hotel really tired after a long day is traveling at five past nine and can't check in. Or to check in, they have to hunt the halls to find some member of staff who can help. Or they have to, well, you can fill it in yourself. So people that use your services are stakeholders. Society is a stakeholder. You might look at your hotel and decide, oh, look, we've got a nice big room. Why don't we hold a, a rave every weekend? Do people still have raves? I don't know. Why don't we have a, an all night rave every weekend and that way we'll bring in money? Well, you will, but the people that live close to your hotel might have something to say about it. If you're banging out music all night, So there's all sorts of organisations you have to think about. You have to think about particular people, but you also have to think about people in the wider sense. So that's when I say labour there, you have to think about people that work for you and they might have representatives and they need to be thought of as well. Public bodies might be involved. So that rave that they're going to have might need a licence from the local council. Will you get that? So there's a whole lot of interlinked people who will be involved in what you're doing and have a say in what you're doing. Can I just check that you're hearing me okay? Because I'm looking at my teams and I'm yeah, glitching again back. whenever I'm Yeah, move. you sound okay, but your webcam's a little bit stuttery. All right, okay. Well, I don't think you're missing anything not seeing my mouth move. So if the sound goes as well, just let me know. to decide who's involved and then you need to think about how they're involved. Um, are they involved just now? Will they be involved in the future? Will they be involved if the policy changes? Does it bring them into something? Does it exclude them from something? What about what happens in the future? And one of the key things of course is what power do they have? Are they in a position to approve this? Are they in a position to decline it? And that's 
bringing the real world into what you're doing. Because there'll be a lot of people who have uh, an interest or we're a pile of people that are affected, but they may not actually get the choice. But that doesn't mean they won't be resentful. It doesn't mean they don't want to hear about it. It means that you have to manage a change process really carefully. And there's some steps that you'd go through. You figure out who the stakeholders are. And as I say, it might not just be individuals, it can be organisations, organisations, organised groups, departments, companies, governmental organisations, whatever. And there could be a lot of them. So you might want to sort them a wee bit and try and figure out if there are particular places that they belong. And because there's a lot of them, you might have to prioritise as well. And part of that is trying to figure out a combination of how much interest they have in something. So a change that you make might affect them directly, but also how much influence they have. Can they actually change it if you make that? Or is that a, a change that's made by a manager or, or some other person? You also have to do a more nuanced analysis. So it's not just who's involved, it's who's going to support you? Who is going to get in the way? If you decide to bring in a new computer system, and I'll use some very horrible stereotypes. If you bring in a new computer system to a front desk that has a 21 year old and a 60 year old working behind that desk. The stereotype might be that the 21 year old will go, yeah, no problem. Where do we, how do we work it? What's the options? And the 60 year old might go, I'm not interested, go away. So they might try and block the change. So it's about getting people on board as well. So you have to try and understand the people that are involved, understand what it is that they want to do and how you get through to them. And it may not always be what you expect. So I just used a stereotype there and I can immediately give you a contrary example. I did uh, it was actually for the Millennium, I put in a new computer system. And I had heard third hand about someone who was trying to block the system, they weren't happy. They hadn't approached me directly, they were just moaning. And when I caught up to them, it was a young person. And I was trying to understand what their issue was with the system, because I, I, as far as I was concerned, I had a, a good relationship with this person. And it turned out that their issue was they knew how the processes worked. So even though they were the youngest in the department, they actually were in a way directing the work of the other people in their office. And by putting in the computer system, which was going to take them through step by step, they felt that they were losing their power. So they wanted to block the system and keep the one that they had, that they were the only ones that could understand. So these things get very muddied, they get very complicated. And that's why I stressed last week the power of communication. You have to be able to talk to people, you have to be able to understand people, you have to be able to create relationships with people. And I know certainly for me, that's the, that's the biggest challenge that I face. I can do the tech stuff, no problem. The interpersonal stuff, that gets trickier. So you have to go through that process. Figure out who needs what. And start to map those. And there's actually this grid that we can use. And you can see on the Y axis, it's a power axis and on the X axis is an interest axis. So we might, for example, have 
a new system that's going in to make new orders. The managing director of the company doesn't really have an awful lot of, no, sorry, I'll take that back. The finance director of the company doesn't really have an awful lot of interest in that system. She understands it's something that needs to go in, but she's not too concerned about how it works or anything, as long as it does work. On the other hand, as a director, and specifically as someone who's involved in finance, they have a lot of power. If they step up and go, oh, why are we spending this money? What's the reason for it? Whatever, you have an issue. So they are here. They don't have a lot of interest in it as a project as such, but they have quite a lot of power. And the grids conform to that. So you might have low interest, not a lot of power. You still want to keep them involved, so you might create a a newsletter that you send out just to see what's happening and just keep everybody going. Better that you do it than they start to, I don't know, spread rumours in the canteen about what's going on. You have people that will be directly involved and you absolutely want to get them on board. They may not have the power, it may not be their choice about what to do, but they're going to be really involved. They're going to be the ones that are using it. They're going to be the ones that are involved in the changes. If you can get them on your side, that will help you a lot. And of course, we have the key player stuff. They're incredibly interested and they're a key player and they have a, a key influence. So, for example, the sales director is incredibly interested in whether she can get orders in and also has influence in which system it is, how it works and all the rest of it. So you need to keep them on board. You need to keep them very close and engage really intensely to ensure that they understand what the issues are, why you're making the recommendations that you are and so on. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. I, if I can just add on to that a little bit, Tony, like I had a when I did the software job, um, we had customers who were really reluctant to move on to like a, a charging module with the software. So it was like basically to streamline everything and to like do all your warehouse charges for like all the stock kept in aisles and stuff. And it charged it on a weekly basis. And this customer was really hesitant to move to the advanced module because the old one was what they knew. It's what they knew the most intimately. They knew how to do every trick, rook, cranny of it. They knew it all. All it took for them to eventually get to the new one was basically a demo. And they hadn't seen it before. They didn't know how it looked, how it worked. So it was my job to sit for half an hour, an hour to show the ladies who were in charge of it how, how it worked. And by the end of it, they agreed it was a lot better, a lot simpler, and we got them upgraded that week. So they end up being in this part. They are interested because it's going to be their job to use it. I can't see your Do mouse here, sorry. A key player, is it? Uh, no, I just did one at the bottom as well. Is that coming through properly? It's uh, not yet. Is that arrow not showing up? Uh, I can't see one unless I'm missing it. No, I can't see anything either. In theory, I'm writing on this slide. It's showing up on mine and it's showing up on my screen. Hold on, I'll send you what I can see just now, Tony, just, just to sanity check. There's also a nice view of my notes as well. No, nothing happening. Although you circled the key player. Yeah. All right, so you've got that. I've actually circled some other stuff and done some arrows as well, so I'm no. assuming it's not come through yet. Try just unsharing it and sharing it again. It might just be one of those daft things. I think it's a bandwidth thing, and I think it's related to the way my, my video keeps glitching. Mm. Point is, it's under the keep informed one. Right. And because you showed them what they were doing, because they then understood how it was going to work, they can actually turn into support. 
So even though they won't probably make that decision, they can tell people, oh yes, we've played with this, it's really good. This is a good thing that we'll be doing. So you've communicated, you've kept them updated, and you've moved them to the right. You've moved them from a low priority to a keep informed. And they've become a, a support. Team. And that's one. Sorry, I'm just trying to make your picture bigger. Can't do it on that one. I'm guessing what's happening here is my teams. So I am going to come out and I'm going to come back in because I can't even switch to another application just now. I can't switch to teams to see that picture. OK, so don't go away. I am going to log out and I'll come back in again in a couple of minutes. OK. No bother, Tony. Afterwards, right? I wasn't even sure if Emdy could heal that there because my screen has just gone grey. Everybody's gone weird. <laughs> uh, yeah, we'll, we'll see you back in a minute.
Welcome back. Thank you. That took three times there to even just join the meeting again. Oh dear, Teams is just it takes up so much. Yeah, it's almost as bad as Chrome these days. I'm just having a gander to see how much it takes for me. Yeah, it's about a gig for me at the moment. Ah, there was definitely a leak as well, because it gets worse the longer it goes on. Yeah. Okay, so. We were talking about getting people on your side. And I could see from that picture that the stuff that I was pointing to on the screen wasn't appearing on your screen. And I see that it's decided that my monitors have changed around again. Maybe this at this point you should switch to a Mac full time, Tony. I've got my Surface screen here and I've got two monitors connected to it. And for a long time, the one up there was monitor two and the one there was monitor three. Every time I turn on, it's a guess as to which one will be two and which one will be three. Hmm. I'll, I'll take a look, Tony. I think there's a way that you can hard code like things based on like a device ID of how you set them up. Um, I can't remember where I would have seen that, but if I find it, I'll send it to you. No, I actually think it's a hardware thing every so often. You know that noise you get when a USB connection comes loose mm -hmm. or goes in for that matter? Every so often my monitor turns off and I hear that noise and it's as if it's connecting and disconnecting, reconnecting, disconnecting, reconnecting, disconnecting. It just goes around a wee loop. 50% mm. of CPU in a Mac. I mean, it's just, there's no reason for that. I just, I cannot imagine what Teams is doing that requires that amount of power. Anyway, let's finish this lecture before my computer spontaneously explodes. So we need a plan. So I said last week it's important to have communication skills. So you need a plan to keep the stakeholders informed, let them know what's going on. You certainly don't want them uh, creating their own rumours, it's far better to give them a complete uh, idea of the thinking. Well, possibly not complete, but certainly regular. And you may actually want to have different types of communication. You might have a different type of communication for the people in the computer support department, as you do for the people in the canteen, as you do for uh, the board of directors simply because they're interested in different things. It's a little bit of social engineering there, Tony. Like I, again, I can kind of relate to that because I've spoke to like top dog and warehouse managers, and then I've also spoke to the workies. And, you know, you're going to speak to the workies much more different than you're going to speak to their boss sort of thing. Like you can have a joke, a laugh and be slightly informal. You shouldn't, but you can. But with the managers, like you're going to get on a lot better. Generally speaking, uh, if if you've got a different and more professional demeanour, unless they're like the workies, then in that case, it, it works out better for you. Yeah, I think the only thing I would disagree with that is what you said you shouldn't, because actually sometimes you should, not immediately, but as you build up a relationship, of course, speaking informally, using humour, anything that you can do to, to make that relationship better is good. It's just like, uh, well, the reason I'm saying you shouldn't is just because of what my boss wanted from me and, and that job. Like, he, he wanted me to obviously get on and stuff, but he obviously didn't want me to sit there cracking too many jokes because I've got work to do. So, you know. Yeah, finding the balance is difficult. Yeah. Well, I noticed that my screen is freezing again. And in an attempt to find out what's going wrong, I thought I'd start up Task Manager. And now task manager's not responding, so I'm having a really good day. What model of surface is it you've got, Tony? Uh, pass. It's about three years old. Four years old, probably now. It's a three or a four, then. I think it's a got. three pro, but I wouldn't swear to it. 
I think you've probably got a sixth gen i5 or i7 in it, if I'm thinking that might be a little underpowered to do the, both of the monitors. I mean, I don't know how long it's been working successfully for you, but just from my own techie knowledge, these integrated graphics are a bit pants. It's more than happy with the monitors. It's only when I use Teams. Teams. So I, I didn't reboot this machine from before Christmas until I had my first lecture after Christmas, which is probably the end of January. Mm. But now I have to reboot it. You have to to use Teams. Could you not move it to Zoom or something that might be less intensive? Well, Teams means that we get all the other stuff. So all your login stuff is all via Microsoft thing. So if I do it on Teams, you immediately get access to it. It means that recordings are all there. So it would just be an awful hassle. Task Manager's come up and Teams is taking 1.52 gigabytes which is just crazy. The only thing I could maybe suggest in that is see the monitor that you want to share out, maybe bump that down from like 1080p to 720 and that way it's less resolution to put out over the net. Don't know. And that would be an issue if it was just a bandwidth thing, but one and a half gigs isn't just a bandwidth thing, that's a Teams thing. Yeah. I'm just meaning like if Teams is pushing that out and that's somehow, you know, contributing to the high memory usage, it might put it down a little bit at least. Don't know. Just just as something I would probably try. Well, according to Task Manager, my network use is so low that it registers as zero percent. Disk zero percent, CPU twenty percent, GPU eight percent, but memory ninety-two percent. And it's all teams. Anyway, doesn't matter. Well, it does matter, but there's no point talking about it. Okay. So you need a plan and you need to get the work that you're doing out there. Partly so that you can get everyone on the same page. You want everyone to be pulling towards the same outcome. Again, the fancy name is create a consensus. You want to get people to decide what that new system should look like, what your new setup should look like, how you're going to work it. All of those things need to be decided before you actually change a single line of code or change a single system. You want people on board. You won't always get it. It is um, unlikely that you will get everybody pulling the same way. There'll always be people who don't want to do it or have reservations or all the rest of it. But if you can uh, create a consensus with the majority, it will make your life an awful lot easier. Thanks, Jason. I'll have a look at that link later. So, soft systems methodology is part of that. It's just basically saying the stuff that we do in tech actually affects people. So you have to think about the soft systems, not just the hard systems. It's about how we work with people. It's about how we communicate. It's about how we get an understanding of what people want, what they don't want, and how we then use that to actually affect the change that we need to make. And knowing that different people will have different priorities will help in that. So again, that comes back to setting up your stakeholders, understanding who they are, what they want to do, and what they want out of it. And there's a kind of formal way of approaching that. So you enter the situation, you find out what the issue is, once you've done that, you have to express it. So you have to get it down on paper somehow so that people can understand what it is that you're doing. Then you have to get at the root issue. So say, for example, you've come into a situation where um, the problem is that deliveries are always late. 
OK, seems simple. We need to hire more people, more vans and get the del more delivery drivers going. Well, do we? Why are the deliveries late? Well, it turns out that the vans are breaking down and people aren't getting the deliveries. Ah, so why are the vans breaking down? Well, they're doing a lot of mileage and whereas before we would send them in for a service every year, the recommended service is actually dependent on the number of miles and with all the extra um, deliveries that we're doing, we're hitting that miles earlier. Why is that? Because people are using us more often. So why is it breaking down? Because we're not servicing. Why not? Because we got the time wrong. So the actual answer isn't hire more people and buy more vans. The answer to why are our deliveries late is service the vans on a proper schedule. So you can start building. That's just a very simple one, a very specific one, but you might have lots of things like in this case study that you need to address. So you have to start building a model of how all the systems fit together. How the reception fits together with cleaning the rooms, how the restaurant fits with the cafe, fits with the function hall, how all of these come together to create a booking system that everybody can use. You need to start figuring out how all the systems work together. And then you can start to bring your own analysis to it. We have a problem in the cafe. What's that? It takes ages to take to pay people. Why is that? Well, we're only doing cash. Why is that? Ah, we don't have any credit card facilities. Why is that? Because we've never set them up because we don't have the proper set up with the bank. So you move from it's slow for people getting out and you actually realize you've got a bigger problem because people might not even be coming in because a lot of people won't go in somewhere if they can't use their cards. And you compare what's happening with your situation with what might be happening elsewhere using your knowledge. And that might be on credit cards, it might be on bookings, it might be on, you know, you decide. Once you've got those two models, what is happening, what could be happening, then you have to figure out how you get from one to the other. What do you have to put in place to get from where you are now to where you want to be and other different options? And only once you've done that, can you take the action? And if you look at that slide, I mean, that's not rocket science. It's not anything that you don't actually implicitly know. All we're doing is trying to set out those steps to make it clear how you go through them. And part of the reason we do that refers to what I started off today talking about, to actually think about how it is we're thinking and to make sure that we don't miss out anything or change how we uh, approach a problem because of how we think. So it's worth going through the stages, certainly to begin with, until we are clear about what those stages are. There is one thing in there that um, just out of interest, are you seeing that zoomed? Does that work? Uh, no, it's yep. just the, the slide as is. See, I've zoomed that in on the text root definitions. And it's just not working, I take it. Okay. No, I think we're, we're still in the soft systems methodology slide. Yeah, but oh, yeah. under build, the last two words are root definitions. Yeah. So I've yeah. zoomed in on that in my screen. I'm assuming that's not working on Teams at all. Right not. So what do we mean by a root definition? Well, there's some uh, techniques that we can use. 
and one's called Cat O. C A T W O E. And it's to try and again put some techniques that we can always use around these analyses that we're doing. And it's an acronym. C is for the customers. What is it we're doing? How does it affect them? A is for those actors that we're talking about. Individuals, departments, organisations, both internal and external. So who are the actors? What's it going to involve? What impact will it have on them? T is for transformation. What is the transformation that we're going to do? What's going to happen? How will that work? W, any German speakers in the class? W is for Weltanschung. And because there's no German speakers, I can mispronounce that all I want and nobody can pick me up on it. It means the worldview. What's the bigger picture? I'm going to transform the hotel into a rave destination. Well, no, you're not because the world says that you can't. The owner. Now, this doesn't necessarily mean the person who has the financial stake in what you're doing. It could be the owner of the change. So if, for example, you put your credit card uh, facilities into the cafe, the owner of that is the cafe manager. It's whoever owns the situation that you're changing. Whoever's responsible for it. Whoever the finger will be pointed at. If it goes right, it goes wrong or whatever. And the final one, the E is for environment. Oh, we're not making money in the cafe, but we could if we had um, twice the size of cafe. Yeah, well, good luck with that, because unless you're going to build out onto the lawn, that's not happening. OK, so it's a way again of trying to put some structure against what we're doing. So you should do a cat woe analysis of the case study in your groups and start to figure out all these things. You should do the stakeholder analysis and try and figure out these things. Over the next few weeks, we'll be doing more analytical types. They're already on Moodle and you should be applying those to your analysis. Now, you wouldn't always apply all of these uh, analyses to every problem. But what I'm trying to do is give you an overview of all of these different types, how they work, so that you can choose the appropriate tool for the particular situation. That makes sense? Yep. Yeah. OK, so that's our overall process. We have a business opportunity or development or change or whatever it is we want to do. We figure out the stakeholders, we do the analysis, we use soft systems for that, and we implement a cat -O analysis to the situation. Once we've done all that, we can come up with a solution and that will have technical, functional, uh, all the different bits that you would do for any situation. But the important part there is agreed. So you'll come up with stuff, but it has to be agreed. And only once you've done that can you actually continue on to modeling the business, figuring out what it is, how the business is set up. And again, we will look at some modeling techniques. Some of you that were in the lab this morning will have seen the discussion, so UML is one of those modeling techniques that we'll use. So part of what's going to be in your report and part of the reason the lab's about Lucidchart is in creating these business models. So we'll talk about the different business models that there are and I'll expect to see those in the report. Questions?
You've all gone very quiet. What, what's, what's the difference between writing a business case for business systems analysis and writing a transformation plan? One of the problems I always have in answering these questions is that different people use uh, different terms to describe the same thing or use the same terms to describe different things. The answer that I will give take in that context, so as far as I am concerned, the plan is what's going to happen. This is what we are going to do. And the transformation process are the steps that you need to carry out to complete that plan. Okay. That makes sense? Yeah. So we're not just assessing it as is, we're then having to suggest um, ways towards their aim. Correct. Okay. So it's not using, just the, okay, yeah. Using models yep. and, pro and processes. Yep. With models yeah. in them. So your model as it is just now, and model as you would like it. Because if you had the case study, they've asked you what they're going to do. It's a hotel, it's not making money. How do they become a hotel that makes money? Get Gordon Ramsay in. The hotel inspector, she's better. You can tell I'm speaking to students who do, don't do anything all day except watch daytime TV. I have no idea who these people are. Not me, I've not got time. <laughs> I miss Jeremy Kyle, that's all I'm saying. Yep, Any questions that aren't about daytime television? At the start, um, do you do a soft systems methodology diagram? Or do you just talk no, about it? No, not as such. Soft I systems think. methodology is a way of approaching what you're going to do. So it's That's not, fine. as far as we're concerned, it's not a do this and do this and do this. It's I'm thinking about how all the systems come together. So it's not just the straight technological stuff. It's all the other things. OK. <laughs> I was going to ask. Sorry, I was just laughing because I saw the cat there. It's about thinking about all the other things that come into that as well. So it's about the communications. It's about the making relationships, about all that kind of stuff. So that's not in the plan as such. It's how you go about helping to implement the plan. That sound reasonable? Yes. Um, I was just going to ask you, Tony, like, I've obviously seen, seen like some of the job adverts for business system analysts and stuff. Is business system analysts, is that like a generalised role or is it does it boil down to a specialist? So, for example, could you be like a warehousing business analyst or a manufacturing business analyst or is it all under like the one umbrella? Uh, both. So the stuff that I'm covering is general business analysis. But of course, when you actually get the job, there is a business. So in this particular case, you're going to be hotel business analysts. So you'll use the business analysis techniques. You'll use all the tools that you can find but about a hotel. But if the job that you're doing is for a warehouse, or for retail or for anything else, then you become a warehouse business analyst or a retail business analyst. In the beginning, that doesn't matter so much because at the start of your career, you won't be the lead business analyst. But as you progress in your career, you might get more experience and that experience might be in particular places. So just like any other job, if you have gone in and been a business analyst for three different retail places, then it's a lot easier to get your fourth 
business analyst retail place. And less likely that you'll get a, I don't know, a warehousing place or a, an accounting place. So the techniques, everything is generalized. Your actual experience and your actual work, clearly they'll be specific to what needs done. That's a brilliant answer. Thank you. Any other questions just now? OK, in that case, I will do the usual. I will turn off the recording. Very slowly. Oh, come on, that's just stupid. Menu has finally popped up. That's bad. <laughs> Okay, so that's a recording stopped. Does anyone have anything?